You know, part of the reason we do Christmas family communion is you really can't separate the birth of Christ and the death of Christ. He was born to die so that we could be born again. Have a seat if you would. If you've got a Bible, we're going to be in John uh, chapter 6 today. Glad we got the, the kids in here with us this morning. So kids, i got a job for you today. I want you to show the adults how to behave. Okay, I know they've been teaching you well in Kids Rock and Club 56, and we have some adults in here who need a good influence, so if you could, uh, <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for admitting it, Jacob, confession's good in church, so um, yeah, kids, if you could just kind of set a good example for them, I think that would be helpful to our growth at True Life Church, so um, everybody excited about Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> Kids, you excited about Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's one of the best things about being a kid. When I was a kid, I thought Christmas was just kind of magical. Uh, and, and, you know, usually around Christmas, you talk about, like, what do you want? What are you going to get? Or after Christmas, it's like, you know, what did you get? Are you excited about it? That kind of thing. I, I'm sure the kids are excited to open presents, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> parents though if you ever, you ever had an experience though with with Christmas and, and your kids where um, like you uh, you know you put this time effort and money and money uh, into you know Christmas and getting stuff for your kids getting what they wanted this kind of thing and like when they were little it's like they opened the present but then they played with the box and the wrapper instead of the present you know what I'm talking about or like, <laughs> now the kids are confessing. We're gonna we're gonna have revival today. Um, and or like, you know, they get it and it's awesome for like 36 hours, and then it gets discarded somewhere in the land of never used toys, never to reappear again. And uh, you're like, is this all there is to this? Is isn't there more to uh, to Christmas than than this? Um, well, maybe the, the, the Grinch, Dr. Zeus, uh, Dr. Seuss, when he expressed this, when he said, And the Grinch, with his Grinch, Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling, how could it be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? And so, that's what we're going to talk about today, the fact that Christmas really comes from more than a store, that it really does mean a little bit more, because really, ultimately, Christmas is about the coming of Jesus, and ultimately, it's not about what we give each other, but about what Jesus came uh, to give us. And so we're going to look at in John chapter 6 today, which may not seem like or may not be a kind of a traditional Christmas passage, but uh, since we're doing Christmas family communion, I wanted to talk about something that really shows us both the, the coming of Jesus and the dying of Jesus. And, and we'll see that get connected together in, in this passage. Uh, but we're going to talk about three things that Jesus uh, came to give us. So in John chapter 6, if you've got a Bible, or you can read along on the screen, let me just kind of uh, set the stage for us a little bit here. Uh, in, in the first 20 or so verses of uh, this chapter, Jesus had done a, a couple of miracles. Uh, the first one was when uh, the little boy gave up his lunch, and, and, and Jesus multiplied that, and he, and he fed thousands of people, and really used it as kind of an object lesson for his disciples. And then... After that, they're trying to get away from the crowds, and his disciples are, are uh, in a boat on the lake, and a uh, you know, storm comes up, and Jesus comes walking to them on the water, and you know, they get over to the other side, they get to where they're going. And so then the next day, the people, because of you know, the miracle they'd seen, the provision of food that he had given them, they're looking for Jesus, and he's not there anymore, and so they're trying to find him. And so, you know, they head over to the other side as well uh, to go and, and try to find Jesus. And so that's kind of the context 
They're, they're talking to Jesus, and we'll pick up uh, for time's sake in verse 25 as they're conversing with Jesus, and it says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this in the Gospels, but, but this would be uh, another example of this. You ever notice that oftentimes Jesus answered people's questions, but he didn't really actually answer the question that they asked? And, and, and this would be one of those occasions. Um, because they said, you know, when did you come here? And he didn't say, well, you know, like at midnight last night, I walk, went walking on the water and, and, and that kind of thing. He said, he really got past the superficiality of their question and went to the heart. And he said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs. And, and the word sign in the Gospel of John means a miracle with a message attached to it. That, that makes sense. It's like a miracle that he's using to teach people. Um, it's like if you've ever been to church, you know, where the pastor did an object lesson for kids. It's kind of like that, except supernatural kind of stuff. Uh, so he said, you seek me not because you saw the signs, not because you saw the miracles, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. In other words, he's saying your motivation is not my glory. It's not my supernatural power. It's just you getting what you want. It's just you having your needs met. It's just me doing uh, stuff for you. And then he says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. They said to him, so what we're reading here is a conversation between this crowd and Jesus, and whoever's speaking for the crowd. What should we do that we may work the works of God? And then in a very important reply, and we'll come back to this at the end, Jesus, his answer then is, this is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. In other words, the work is not the, the, all the works you do for God. The work that matters is that you're trusting Me. Because salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's what Jesus has done for us. Therefore they said to Him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will, will you do? Now, this is getting to the heart of what we're going to look at. He says, Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. Remember, the book of Exodus, Moses leading the children of Israel. They don't have any food out in the desert. So God is sending manna down from heaven uh, to, to feed them. This is what this conversation is referring back to. Uh, so they say, you know, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to Him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now, understand, just be real clear here, because I know kids tend to be literal. I know I was when I was a kid. Like I, I thought like when I was a kid, if... Um, Somebody like talked about catching a cold. I thought that meant if somebody caught my cold, then I got better. It's like I, I, I gave it to them, right? We can be literal. Or like when my mom would talk about going to a shower, uh, you know, like a, a bridal shower or something. I thought, man, that's so weird. Why are they giving this woman a shower? Can't she do it herself? I mean, when kids are literal. So uh, this, this is not saying Jesus was literally... Maybe I was just a weird kid, but uh, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is not literally saying here that he's like a loaf of bread, okay? You know, th this is a, a symbol because he goes on to say, he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So, so what he's saying here is, I'm the one that can satisfy you on the inside. It's not about just physical food. It's not about just you know, what I give you externally. It's about the peace, the joy, the forgiveness, the satisfaction, the hope, the purpose that I can give you on the inside. I'm the one that can fill you up. Not these other kinds of things. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So listen, if you're here today and you're, you know, you're searching for peace and hope and meaning and joy and satisfaction, you feel empty, you feel like there's a hole in your heart, you feel like there's something missing, 
The answer to that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 36, then he says, But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So you see in salvation, it's a work of God. And it's our response. It's God's sovereignty. It's our responsibility. You can't separate the two. God draws, we believe. I don't know all the details of that, but the Bible's very clear about that. You didn't decide to get saved. Listen, if you got saved, it was the grace of God in the choosing, in the inception, in the drawing, in the faith, in every other part of it. We can't take any credit for our response. And listen, if there's something going on in your heart today where you're feeling guilty over your sins and you see that Jesus is the remedy, the hope, the answer for your sins, know that that's the Holy Spirit working within you and know that He's giving you the faith to believe and now is your time to respond to Him and to trust Jesus and to give your life to Him. So why did, why did Jesus come? Three things, and, and we're going to hit these quickly, uh, but, but three reasons that, that, that Jesus came. Number one, Jesus came to give us divine revelation. In other words, Jesus came to reveal God to us. Uh, you know, the, one of the biggest parts of the Christmas story, Matthew 1, is that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And you know, really, that's what he's saying uh, in, in, in these verses. If you uh, look at these verses, Jesus says that he's the bread who came down from heaven. Jesus is not just any other baby. Jesus was you know, conceived in a different way, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because He's God. He's the eternal Son of God who took on flesh. What we sang in the line of in Christ alone. Um, fullness of God and helpless babe. You know, what a better way to describe what the Bible says about him. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily. Colossians 2.9. Jesus is God. When he, when, he says, when he calls himself here, when he says, I am the bread of life, and when he say, calls himself, I am, that was the name that God told Moses was his name in the book of Exodus. So what he's saying there, he's claiming to be God. So the Christmas story is about God becoming a man. Uh, you know, Jesus is not just another baby. He's not just a, a good teacher, a prophet or something like that. He's God come in human flesh. Do you believe that? You know, Jesus asked the question. He said, who do you say uh, that I am? What do you believe about Jesus? Do you believe that He's the Son of God? Do you believe that, that He's God who, who became a man to come and die for our sins? I mean, that's hard to comprehend, isn't it? Somebody could be fully God and fully man. You know, what may be even harder to comprehend is, is the love that it took to do that. I mean, think about that. C.S. Lewis gave this analogy. He said, like, what if you were a dog lover and, and, and all the, the dogs of the world were in you know, great danger, had a great problem or something, and it took you becoming a dog to save them? Would you do that? Or maybe a better analogy would be, what if all the cats of the world <laughs> were in, in desperate danger, and I was called upon to become a cat in order to save all the cats of the world. Now, if you know my thoughts about cats, you know what a big stretch that would be. But that's not nearly as big of a stretch as the eternal God leaving the beauty and splendor and glory and perfection of heaven to become one of us. To live as we live. To experience what we experience. To uh, experience the pain 
of this fallen world. And ultimately, to die as one of us, a death He did not deserve, bearing all the sins that He did not commit. That's why Jesus came. That's what Christmas is about. Jesus came to give us divine revelation. He's God coming in to the world. But the second reason that Jesus came is that Jesus came to give us internal satisfaction. Internal satisfaction. Remember what he said again. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger and will never thirst. He said later on in the Gospel of John that out of us are going to flow rivers of living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit inside of us. There's our hope and our peace and our joy and our strength. And so, I want you to think about this for a minute. You know, apart from this in this life, Where do you find satisfaction, really? Something that truly satisfies. Something, you know, on the inside of us that that lasts. I want you to watch a a video clip and and just kind of think about how it relates to this. It's, uh, It's something, it's Jim Carrey getting ready to present an award at the 2016 Golden Globe Awards. It's very funny, but I think it makes a very important point as well. From the upcoming film, True Crimes, please welcome two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. Thank you. I am two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. You know, when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just a guy going to sleep. I'm two-time Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey going to get some well-needed shut-eye. And when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream. No, sir. I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winning actor Jim Carrey. Because then I would be enough. it would finally be true. (laughs) And I could stop this this terrible search. (laughs) For what I know ultimately won't fulfill me. Did you hear that? You know, what's ever going to be enough? Uh, You know, the famous country uh, music singer uh, Merle Haggard had 38 of his albums appear on Billboard's country music top 10 charts. More than a dozen made it to number one, 38 number one singles. Haggard also had five wives and spent time in San Quentin prison. Uh, in, in an interview uh, with, with Rolling Stone, he said this, he says, there's a, a restlessness in my soul that I've never conquered. Uh, not with motion, marriages, or meaning. It's still there to a degree. And it will be till the day that I die. Where do we find satisfaction? Um, I read one of the most fascinating articles I've ever read this past week. It's a New York Times article, and it's titled, Yale's Most Popular Class Ever, Happiness. Listen to this. Here's a synopsis of it. The most popular course in the history of Yale University was offered in the fall of 2017 uh, with the official title, Psychology 157, Psychology and the Good Life, subtitled by the New York Times, Happiness. How to be happy. Now this is Yale University, you know, Ivy League, like most prestigious school uh, that that you could go to just about. Nearly one-fourth of Yale undergraduates registered for the class. Like 1,200 students. And ironically, uh, it, was, it originally started meeting in a chapel. Now, they moved to a bigger place to accommodate everybody, but it originally started meeting in an old place of worship on that campus. Um, 
Uh, Laurie Santos, the psychology professor who teaches the course, says that she, quote, tries to teach students how to lead a happier, more satisfying life, end quote. Um, no wonder the course has caught on. A 2013 report by the Yale College Council found that more than half of undergraduates sought mental health care from the university while enrolled. One of Santos's principal lessons uh, that she tries to teach them, because most Yale undergraduates associate achieving, uh, you know, with happiness, like a high grade, great internship, good paying job, then you're going to be happy. By the basis of scientific sociological research, don't actually increase happiness at all. Quote, scientists didn't realize this in the same way 10 or, more, 10 or so years ago, Santos says. Our intuitions about what will make us happy, like winning the lottery and getting a good grade, are totally wrong. So if those things don't satisfy us, if those things don't fulfill us, those things don't make us happy, what does? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says, if you come to me, you're not going to hunger. You're not going to thirst anymore. That's where true internal satisfaction is going to be found. The prophet Jeremiah put it this way in Jeremiah 2.13. He said, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can, ha that can hold no water. What's he saying there? He's saying if their trust and their hope is in anything other than Jesus Christ, it's like drinking stagnant water, and it's like trying to get it out of something that has a hole in it, and so it won't last. Jesus came to give us divine revelation, and He came to give us internal satisfaction but last, Jesus came to give us eternal salvation. He came to give us eternal salvation. Let's look at verse 40 again. Go back to that, uh, Aaron. So this is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. And so they, they go on from there in, in, in this conversation uh, if we could look at a little bit of it quickly, in verse 41, it says, The Jews complained about him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then, he says, I've come down from heaven? And so that underscores that the, the virgin birth, that really actually matters. And, they, and Jesus answered and said, Don't murmur among yourselves. Uh, you know, don't be gossiping, those kind of things. He says, no one can come to the Father unless he, he who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, uh, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, he says it again, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. He's doubling down on all these things. He says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for which I give for the life of the world. And, and once again, remember, he's being symbolic here. He's not being literal. He's not talking about cannibalism or, or something like that. Uh, you know, when, when this idea of his flesh and the bread and all these kind of things, it relates to communion. You know, what we're going to take in a few minutes, symbolic. The bread of his body broken for us. The juice of his blood spilled for us. And so what he's saying, the way that we can have salvation the way that we can have everlasting life, the way and the only way that we can be brought into a relationship with God is through Him because He's the Son of God who came from heaven to earth and that He was going to go to the cross and He was going to give His life for us. His body was going to be broken. His blood was going to be spilled. He was going to be tortured and brutalized. But He was doing that not as a, as, as a martyr. He was doing that as a sin-bearing, wrath-absorbing sacrifice in order to make us right with God. That's the point uh, of, of all of this. And so he's saying that if we're going to have salvation, it's through Him. 
He came to give us internal satisfaction right now. He came to give us eternal salvation forever. In, in the 1960s, Mary Ellen Rothrock was a graduate student in English literature at the University of Wisconsin. In 1998, she wrote a story, basically shared her testimony in Christian Reader magazine. And here's what she wrote. She said, despair seemed to permeate the student body, especially those in the humanities. A fellow graduate student summed it up cynically. Playwright Samuel Beckett is right. Man is just a piece of trash in a universe that's running down. And apart from God, you know, that's a, a pretty uh, or not uncommon uh, philosophy. In college, atheism became my religion, she said. Yet when I got into grad school, I found myself seeking to fill a spiritual void in my life. I began practicing transcendental meditation. I met periodically with a TM supervisor. After a year or so of meditating, I, I mentioned that I had a recurring thought that I was trying to concentrate on my uh, mantra. It's a line from Handel's Messiah. Something in my mind keeps repeating, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. To my young mind, not only was the music thrilling, but the words seemed to come from beyond this wor world. I love the joyful language. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. For unto us a child is born, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. The TM supervisor told me to ignore the words that come coming to me, but I told myself, these aren't just random thoughts. Remember what we read earlier? No one comes... This is, it suddenly hit me. The phrase, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, was an invitation from a personal God of glory to seek Him. Why couldn't He be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace? Within months, she met a woman who explained how she could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's what she said, As I heard the words from the Bible, the words from the musical score made sense. The Holy Spirit convinced me of the truth. The God I'd hungered for, this personal God, loved me. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. That's what Christmas is about. That God came to save us, to satisfy us, to make us new, to give us life right now, and life that lasts forever in Him. Do you know this God? Do you have a relationship with Him? Is Jesus your Lord and your Savior? Just to sum all this up, this is what it boils down to. God created us. He made us in His image. He loves us with a love that we can't even understand. It's so big and it's so huge. But see, when He made us in His image, that means that we have the ability to genuinely, truly make choices. If you can truly make a choice, you can make the right choice or the wrong choice. You, you, can, you can do what's right or you can do what's wrong. And you know, sometimes we do what's right, but all of us, a lot of times, have done what's wrong. The Bible calls that sin, and it says that we've all sinned and fallen short. And the thing about sin is it's not just bad choices we've made. It's really about our heart, that our heart condition is that we're proud and we want to be in control of our own life and we want to be our own God. And, and that's really rebellion at the end of the day. And because of that, we're separated from God. We're away from God. And you know, God, because He's perfect, He has to punish sin. And, and, and we deserve to die and go to hell. And But... God, even though we've rebelled against Him, even though we've separated ourselves from Him, He still loves us. And He loves us so much that He still wanted to know us. He wanted to save us. He wanted to have a relationship uh, with us. He wants to be our Father and us to be His children. So He came. Jesus came. Jesus, the Son of God, left heaven, came to earth, born of the Virgin Mary, truly God, truly man, lived a perfect and a sinless life. And then He went to the cross, dying in our place for our sins, taking the punishment that we deserve. And then He rose from the dead to give us life, to bring us into a relationship with God. But the Bible tells us that it's not by what we do then that we receive Jesus and that we're made right with God. It's by trusting what He's done. Let's go back 
to where we were at the, at, at the beginning. Verse 25. Remember they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus said, well, you're seeking me, you know, because you saw the sign. Not because you saw the signs, because of what you're looking for. And then he tells them in verse 27, Don't labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. In verse 28, he said, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Remember Jesus' answer. This is the work of God, that you believe in him. In whom he is sent. Are you believing in Jesus? Are you trusting him? And, and, and the, the word for believe there doesn't mean just, well, yeah, I've, I've heard that. I think that's true. It's not just something in our head. It, it literally means to commit ourselves to, to, to rest upon, to put our weight on. Are you resting on Jesus for the salvation of your sins? And then if we could go uh, to the end uh, of this chapter, um, you know, after Jesus had said all of, of these uh, things, uh, some of the people didn't like uh, what, what he was saying. And, and in verse 66, it, it says that many of his disciples went back and, uh, and, and didn't walk with him anymore. And so Jesus asked the twelve a question in verse 67. He says, do you also want to go away? And then some of my favorite words in the Bible, Peter gave this answer. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? I mean, where else are we going to go? He says, you have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Can you say that today? Is that your conviction? Is that what you're basing uh, your life on? Do you believe that Jesus came to give us divine revelation? That He's God come in the flesh? Do you believe that in Jesus there's internal satisfaction? Do you believe in Jesus there's eternal salvation? Listen, Jesus won't just be an add-on to our lives. He's not just like a self-help guru over on the side to help us have self-fulfillment and self-actualization. If He's going to be in our lives, He's going to be our life. We're going to have to come to the end of ourselves, confess our sins, repent of our sins, surrender to Him in faith and say, Jesus, I don't have anywhere else to go but to You. I'm coming to You. I'm trusting You. I'm going to live my life for You. I'm going to rely on You. You're the bread of life. You're the living water. Only You can satisfy Satisfy me. Only you can save me. I'm trusting you for my eternal salvation. Have you come to that point in your life? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me? You've heard the gospel. Before we celebrate communion, I want to give you a chance to respond. There's some of you here today that you need Jesus, you need him to be your Savior. You need Him to be the living water, the bread of life. You, you need Him to fill that hole in your heart. You need Him to forgive you of your sins. You need that gift of eternal life. You, you need to be brought into a relationship with God. And so my question is, right now, in this moment, are you willing, by faith, to commit your life to Him? You, are you willing to turn from your sin and yourself and your rebellion Say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I receive you into my life. Listen, it's not our works. It's not what we do. It's not going to church. It's not really even praying a prayer. It's by repentance and faith. Turning from our sin. Turning to Christ by faith. Will you trust in Him right now? Will you receive Him right now? And I, I just encourage you, if, if God's working in your heart, to ask Him to forgive you. To ask Jesus to come into your life. Just to express your faith to Him. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Or if you, if you need help, you can pray something like this. As long as you know that, that a prayer in and of itself doesn't save you. It's, it's repentance and faith. This is just a way to express, to confess outwardly what you believe in your heart. And so, if God's dealing with your heart right now, just call on the name of Jesus. You can pray something like this. Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've messed things up. And I know that I need you in my life. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. Right now, I put my faith and my hope and my trust in you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my life 
and to change me. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, take control of me. Listen, I encourage you to do something. If you, you know, trusted Christ, tell me that. Tell one of our other leaders or pastors, they'll all be here. Somebody you know here, or fill out your connection card and turn it in so we can follow up with you. If you've got questions about that, let us know through the connection card or talk to somebody so you can get this settled. For those of us who are Christians, once again, you know, come to the Lord's table. It's not a time, uh, it's not something to take lightly or to take flippantly. And so I encourage you, I'm going to lead us in prayer for a minute, and then we'll move into the time of communion. But uh, I encourage you to um, just take a minute and pray, prepare your heart. Once again, if there's things that God's convicting you of, uh, to, to confess those. Make sure your heart is right with Him as you enter into this time. Uh, so let's pray, and uh, I'll kind of remind us of the instructions, and then we'll uh, you know, move in the time of communion. So if each of the pastors just wants to get positioned while I pray at the table you're going to be at, and then we're ready to go with that. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the bread of life, that you are living water. We thank you for your grace that you would come, sacrifice yourself for us, that you would uh, die for us to, to give us life. Uh, Jesus, we praise your name, and I pray that you draw people to yourself. I pray that you be glorified in this time of communion. Lord, forgive us and cleanse us and fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.